Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Louis R. Lessig about employment law trends and the top employment cases of 2020. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Great to be here with you, Jonathan. Yeah, I am super excited to have this conversation. As we were just getting to know each other a little bit in the pre-interview and dialoguing about the topic for today, and really in preparation, you know, in, in the weeks leading up to this episode, we've been exploring, you know, the topic of employment law trends and really some of the big cases that have happened in the past year or so and what that means. Uh, for organizations moving into the future. So from the employment law standpoint and the intersection of that with organizational leadership and how do we as organizational leaders and managers um, navigate the complexity of this legal, this complex legal compliance um, environment and still try to, you know, do what's best by our, our people, our organization and not getting stuck into, you know, just being completely compliance oriented, but making sure, of course, that we're doing what we need to do, but also being proactive in, uh, in making a, a safe, healthy environment for all of our employees and empowering them and helping them to be their best selves at work. So that's what we'll be exploring together today. As we get started, I just wanted to share uh, Lewis's bio with everyone. Lewis R. Lessig is a partner at the law firm of Brown and Connery LLP in Westmont, New Jersey, in their labor and employment group. He regularly counsels clients, conducts training sessions, and represents clients in federal and state court, as well as before administrative agencies. Mr. Lessig speaks across the country and regularly writes articles that appear in publications nationwide, including Expert HR. In 2018, he won the Delaware Valley HR Consultant of the Year Award. In 2015, he received the Smart CEO S. ESQ Industry Award, recognizing the region's most trusted advisors. He is a member of the National Speakers Association and serves as the immediate past president of the Philadelphia chapter. Mr. Lessig is an active volunteer for the Society for Human Resource Management as a state director for the Garden State Council uh, and is the past legislative director for Garden State Council, SHRM, as well as a past president of the Tri-State HRMA. You can find out more about him at his website at lewislessig.com and at uh, brownconnery.com, uh, his law firm. Again, uh, Lewis, great to be with you today. I'm so excited to have this conversation. Uh, anything else you would like to add by way of background or personal context before we really launch in? Just that this is one of those areas that I'm totally passionate about. Uh, to be honest, my undergrad's in HR, so I feel like I've lived and breathed this since, uh, well, let's just say for more than a few decades. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And it, that's, that's great uh, that you have that HR background uh, before going off to law school. Um, I, I, I think that's really helpful. Sometimes employment uh, law professionals, um, it's inter at least around here, maybe it's different where you live. In Utah, um, it's interesting to talk to people who do lawyers who do employment law that don't seem to have an, a background in HR because um, their their um, take on a lot of the laws is is quite a bit different than the way I would um, take it right and so I think that combination is really helpful and actually quite important as we try to figure out the complexity of this this leg this uh, this legal environment and just how to run organizations effectively uh, one of the things that I always get nervous about is when an organization becomes too risk averse and too compliance oriented to the point where they're not willing to try new things. They're not willing to um, try to innovate. 
And that's not what employment law is about. Like some people get really fearful of employment law and the complexity around it. And then they just kind of uh, shut down in terms of the innovation pieces. And, and uh, that's something that I, I definitely try to counsel with organizational leaders about. Like it's not, a, it's not an either or proposition. You know, you can either be a really cutting edge innovative organization or you can follow all the, the, the legal requirements. You can do both. You totally can. And, you know, that's one of those areas where I find it fascinating. Some of my brethren really just are married to their particular slice of the proverbial pie in employment law or in labor law. And I think we've seen this even politically, although I would argue, you know, we try to avoid that kind of stuff. But the pendulum has gone so many different ways. And I think that's why organizations, no matter how progressive they are, become very concerned about how do we proceed forward. We've just been through four years of a very different administration than probably the one we're going to have now. And frankly, in the business sense, all we really want is some kind of certainty so that we can help our employees do better. I mean, as a business owner, you look at it and say, I have 80 families that depend on me every day to do what I do and how do we do it better? And one of the things that I'm always telling clients is that particularly in my space, everything I do is about your culture. It's about how you want to evolve. And if you start from that place, then the bad word, if you will, of compliance is something that we can sort of put that aside and figure out how to navigate within whatever it is that you do. Absolutely. I love, I love that framing and that perspective. Um, and I think organizations uh, would do well to, to adopt that kind of a mentality. Uh, again, the legal environment's complex and it's always shifting. And, you know, uh, not just um, new legislation that comes into play that you have to follow, but you have to follow case law and how these regulatory agencies are interpreting things and, and new policies and things. And like you said, with, with the previous uh, administration, I think there were some pretty sizable shifts in how certain things were being handled. I, I think especially in terms of uh, labor relations issues and unions, I think there was a huge shift there. Um, and so we, of course we need to stay on top of all of that. And our goal is to, to maintain a healthy workplace environment where we're also not getting sued like crazy or getting fined like crazy, but we, we really can do both. We can uh, also make sure that we're, we have a positive culture. That's not just a culture of fear and compliance, but a culture of empowerment, a culture of innovation uh, and in helping our people to maximize their potential. And, you know, so often I think what we find is that, Organizations that do that well understand that, listen, whatever we do in terms of our organization, whether we build something, whether we're a service organization, that we start from the proposition that we're going to do better because our most important asset are, in fact, our people and where they're going. And the more secure they are, the better we're going to do. And the challenge I think that we get into, I just wrapped up a uh, – a rather large Department of Labor overtime audit. And in trying to explain to the owners that, you know, they're looking at it and saying, listen, we're a frontline healthcare organization. We're not focused on what the Department of Labor wants to do. And my response is, I understand that, but ignorance of the law doesn't work. Although if you didn't understand this aspect of the Fair Labor Standards Act, that's fine. We can sit down with the Department of Labor, work it out. And to be candid, I think we probably saved six figures or so in fines by basically going to the Department of Labor and say, listen, here's our business. This is what we intended to do. They didn't understand what they were doing. I'm now getting them there. And so let's figure out how we move forward. And rather than really hurt them, the investigator turned and said, look, you know, we're just looking to make people whole. So make people whole, correct the problem and move on. And if we had more of that, I think you'd find that life would be a heck of a lot better. And of course, the challenge is like in everything else, 20% of the, shall we say, bad actors create 80% of the work for all of us. And so that's the pendulum that we're constantly trying to balance. Yeah, absolutely. And it really is a pendulum and, and things do kind of swing back and forth. And, and so that's part of the complexity and just staying on top of everything. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, I invited you on the podcast. It's great to have uh, an employment law, labor law update 
for our listeners so they can really stay on top of the latest trends. So with all of that said as kind of the foundation and the precursor to our continued dialogue, I would love to hear your perspective on some of the biggest cases from 2020 and really what does that mean for employment law trends moving into the future? Well, I'll tell you, I, I think there are a couple of things that we've really seen trend wise that we need to keep in mind. One of them is certainly the LGBTQ plus uh, platform, if you will, is going to continue to expand. Obviously, Title VII is now covered under that. Uh, depending on where you are around the country, uh, particularly in the U.S., some places are much more protective than others. Uh, but I think the point is that everyone should be treated the same. And again, we talked earlier about culture. If there's a particular way you want to be treated in the workplace, anyone that you work with should be treated the same way. So in that respect, I don't know that a, a strong organization is really moved that much by those kinds of cases. I think the more interesting stuff that we're seeing are things around salary history questions and what you can and can't ask. And I think the hard part for organizations is to say, well, we want to understand, we may have a range in terms of the money we want to spend, but we want to be fair to the person, but we also don't want to give them a, a windfall or feel like we don't care about them. So we need some frame of, of reference. Uh, and so a lot of that is around how you ask the question as opposed to, you know, well, tell me what you're making now. Um, and certainly the case law certainly supported the idea that, look, we need to change how we approach that issue but that there is still a value in understanding that people feel valued, particularly if you want your organization to be that progressive, um, best place to work type of organization, if you will. Yeah. Can I just comment on that real quick? Sure. Um, so I think, yeah, I, in, in, with regards to, for example, the LGBTQ uh, types of issues, you're absolutely right. Like in terms of federal uh, law and, and compliance with that, that hasn't always been something that has been protected. And more and more over time, um, you know, different organizations have either been proactive about it or states or municipalities have been more proactive about putting in place um, laws. But even federally now, we're seeing the shift. And to your point, if we, if we have a core value as an organization that we want that we value um, diversity and that we we want to treat every individual with dignity and respect, then ultimately whether or not there's some new federal requirement uh, about how you treat trans people or, you know, LGBTQ plus people, um, you, you're already doing it, right? It, so it doesn't actually impact you because you're already treating them well. You're already, um, you're not discriminating and you're treating them with dignity and respect, as, which is what everyone wants. Uh, and so that's, that's the real trick here is that you don't have to have things imposed on you if you're just having, if you're developing an, a healthy organization in the first place. Um, the other comment based on your, your, uh, your comment about uh, the, the pay issue when you're going through the hiring process or the application process, that is one of the pet peeves I have. I, it, it drives me nuts when I see um, organizations asking for pay history. And I, I get it. I get the why there needs to be some sort of calibration um, so that you're not wasting each other's time in terms of expectations. But on the other hand, I, I've seen so many times where organizations basically use that as a means to get away with paying as little as possible uh, to an employee rather than actually paying them what they're worth, paying them you know, you know, uh, valuing the, their contributions. And so that, that dynamic has been something interesting and it has, it's been interesting for me to watch that play out, um, you know, in terms of case law over time, because it is shifting a little bit and it is complicated. So with that said, I'd love to hear a little bit more about like, how do we reframe the question so we can have context and we can have reasonable, like shared expectations. So we're not wasting each other's time through the hiring process without, negatively hurting somebody and, um, and undervaluing them, right? So I need to be fair to you and to the listeners. Uh, I do have a slight jade on this stuff. Um, and the reason is because of my traditional labor work. Because what I have found is that in some industries where you do have traditional labor, the collective bargaining agreements may include limitations on an organization in terms of where you can place someone to the extent that you have a salary guide. And 
I think it's problematic because when we have the salary discussion, let's say someone has 10 years of experience, they're going to come in, they want to be on, on a 15 step guide, they want to be on step 10. But the collective bargaining agreement says you can't bring anybody in above step five. So you're artificially deflating it in favor of the people that are already working there, but we're trying to be fair and it creates a problem. Uh, and I find, generally speaking, that that is an issue that the unions, depending on which union, uh, some are happy to eat their young and they don't care. And some are a bit more pragmatic. But I, I do think it's interesting to note, as you think about how do we get at this issue, that it's not just an employment issue, it is also a labor issue. And no one has it perfect. What I fear the most in this space is that sometimes unions exist to perpetuate themselves rather than to help their people. And yeah, I, I think that's a really fair comment. And yeah, I agree. I, I think w w if, if that dynamic has emerged, then that's not the point of traditional labor and unions, right? which is to be better, better the circumstances for the people, for the employees. Exactly. And, and so when we talk about how do we have those conversations around salary, it's really more about coming to someone who's looking to come into the organization and say, what are you looking for? You know, a much more open rather than where are they right now? Because look, we can all go, whether we're going to go to the, to the federal government or the state government and find out where salary.com and figure out what the range is. You have an idea what you want to pay. You understand when you look, any organization can take a look at their balance sheet and know that 75 to 80% of their bottom line is going to be the salary and benefits. And so approaching someone and saying, what do you think you're worth? Look, if they're, if they're coming in for a job that we know is $75,000 a year and they say, well, I want 150, we know they're barking up the wrong tree. But there has to be some kind of meeting of the minds. And I actually think... If we're looking at this from a cultural perspective, if you're asking somebody and, and you know that the, the position's probably around that seventy-five to eighty thousand dollar range, and they come in and say, I'd like to be making around, let's say, 77, 78, that's not so crazy. That that lets you know that that person wants to be there for the right reason. And I think the key is the intangible what is not said that becomes so important in that area, rather than to your point, Jonathan, this idea of, hey, how cheap can we get out of it? Because that should never be the goal if we know what it takes and what the ROI is in terms of onboarding somebody and when we become profitable with that one hire. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, well, good. So, so we know there's a little bit of shift happening in terms of that, that often uncomfortable point in either the application process or the interview process about talking about salary history and such. Uh, and so that's something to stay tuned with and, and see how that continues to evolve. So another area that I know is, is um, shifting a little bit is around harassment litigation. 
and related training. What are you seeing there and what has been happening in the past year? Well, we've seen a, a bunch of things. The first thing I think that folks are not necessarily paying attention to is, you know, we've done ever since the Ellerth and Farragher decisions back before I, you know, went into practice said, basically we need to do the training in order to, to have the defense as an employer. We've done this cookie cutter version, if you will, of how we need to handle all this training. And the challenge is, it is mind-numbingly boring. I mean, the kind of stuff that just, you're literally snoring. And, you know, the problem with Zoom is with the camera on, people can tell. So I, what I've seen, and I've done a lot of virtual presenting since, what, mid-March, you know, it's all about engagement. There's a reason why it costs a couple of shekels more to do even virtually a live event where you've got some engagement, whether you're using uh, whatever platform, whether it's texting or live polling or what have you, to engage the participants, to get them to think, to make whatever the topic is, and in this case, we're talking about harassment, stickier. Because people think, oh, well, I'm not there. So if I text something, you know, in 140 characters, who's going to see it? No one's going to care. The reality is they do care. And so we have to take advantage of that. We have to understand that. When you look at the statistics around online harassment, the numbers, even pre-pandemic, are through the roof and make us, from an employer's perspective, you got to be concerned because the more we go remote, the more we don't have people in front of us. We don't know what their setup is like. We've got to be teaching folks to be very thoughtful when they get in front of whatever that keyboard is, whatever that smart board might be, because nine times out of 10, the one thing about being at home and being virtual the way we are even today as we're recording this is that idea that we can have a conversation, but you know, you can see the joke is right. You can't see me below the waist. And we, there are plenty of stories about that. Well, the problem is that that also may mean that whatever preconceived notions people have, they bring it to the same thing. And it's not as sanitized as it might be when you're physically in the office. And so whatever we can do to, right. to bring that top of mind has got to happen because we're seeing the increase in the litigation, particularly in the online space, not just because people are home, but because people aren't thinking. Well, and I, and can't, I, I also think, I mean, doesn't it have something to do with when you're working remotely, all of these interactions that may have been kind of organic, like hallway interactions, and then it becomes a he said, she said kind of a situation like now it's all recorded, right? <laughs> Every, everything is recorded or it's all by email or text and you have record of everything, um, which just, yeah, absolutely. You need to be thinking about it and realizing, you know, that you obviously not just because we're being recorded or just because um, there is a, uh, you know, a trail behind everything, a digital trail behind everything that we do, but we, we also want to do it because we don't want to harass people. We don't, we want to treat people well. But the reality is we, we just have, we have to be thoughtful and careful always. But it's amazing. You're absolutely right. Although it's amazing the degree to which we need to remind people about stuff. I mean, I honestly, I just redid a, a portion of the work is, is handbook revisions. And I just redid our own. And I really, there's a dress code section. And normally, you know, it's not a big deal, but now even courts are telling attorneys like you need to be dressed when you're on Zoom in court. Uh, and in the same way, I think we need to be thoughtful about these kinds of things because everyone's on Zoom overload or, or virtual overload and, and they just want to be able to step back. I think from a harassment perspective, we need to be very pragmatic we, and we need to be much more intentional than we, when we were live and in person. Someday we will get back there and I do think we're closer than not, but on the harassment side, we have to do two things. One, the kind of training you provide today has got to be more engaging than what you did before. It is not enough to just pop in the video or press play. There's too much noise and there are too many other devices that someone can use. And at the same time, we have to find ways to make life more interesting and engaging, whether it's VR, whatever the platform may be, so that it becomes more sticky to avoid the potential issues of people not thinking when they're home. Excellent. So I know another area um, that we see some shifts in is around 
marijuana usage, the marijuana landscape, and organizational assessments of employees. What do you see happening there? I love this area. You cannot make this stuff up. Um, here in New Jersey, uh, it, is, it is not the wild, wild west, but it's fascinating. So in case you weren't sure, back in November, we had the election. Five states had different versions of marijuana on the ballot. And I won't call them out, but there was one state that now allows a small amount of, wait for it, cocaine, uh, which is fascinating. That is not here in New Jersey. But the interesting part relative to marijuana and the workplace and the trends we're seeing here in New Jersey, as we go through the regulations, because we've now decided we're going to have recreational marijuana, as they build the recreational regs, they're going through and taking a look at what happened in Colorado and Arizona and other places around the country and saying, what can we learn, what worked and what didn't work? From an employer's perspective, if you don't take anything else away from today, take this. What's the biggest challenge we have with marijuana? The problem is, unlike alcohol, which comes out of our body, and we know there's a breathalyzer, you get pulled over by the cops, and you know exactly what it is, blow into the thing, you refuse, it's an automatic, we presume you're under the influence. If you do, we get the, you know, the .08 or whatever it is that everybody's got to have, right? Or doesn't want, rather. Marijuana stays in you longer. While, and I, here's a little tidbit for you, there is testing and development to come up with a breathalyzer version of marijuana, but it's not there yet for public consumption. So we have to figure out what can we do in the workplace. Now, this is not about what you think about marijuana. This is not about what your managers may think, whether they're pro con, whether they imbibe at home. What I found is this, in order to figure out what to do, we need to be pragmatic. There is no state law remembering, of course, that at the federal level, marijuana is still not a go-to thing. But at the state level, no one says an employer can't say, you're not smoking or eating the edible or whatever here in our workplace. The issue is when, there's, when something occurs or when a manager sees something, what do they do? Here in New Jersey, the proposal is this, that it's a two-part assessment at the workplace. It's a urine or blood test and a visual assessment. So in essence, sort of a field sobriety test you might have by a police officer that would pull you over. And so both of those things together, how do they look? How do they talk? Are their eyes bloodshot? All those little things. In fact, there's a, a new title that I think folks are going to hear more about as it's more developed in places like New Jersey, coming out with new regs, that's called a workplace impairment recognition expert. The idea being sort of like that field sobriety test, how do we see someone in the workplace, whether or not they're under the influence? And so the confluence or the congruence between how they look and what's actually in their system is going to be used together to make that assessment. Those are the kinds of things. And that's the area where I think we're going to find the most amount of litigation going forward. Because let's be honest, no matter what you do within your organization, you're worried about your people, you're worried about your culture, and whatever your bottom line is to make sure you're in business. You are not trying to manage everybody else's marijuana usage, whether it's me medical or recreational. Yeah, and, and you know, that is increasingly complex because the, the, la the legal landscape around uh, medicinal marijuana, even recreational marijuana usage um, is, is changing constantly and it's so different across the United States um, you know some states uh, here in Utah even we're a very red and conservative state but now medicinal medicinal marijuana is legal um, and you know then you go to other places where it's even recreational that's allowed and so how, how do organizations deal with that in terms of the, their existing policies versus their drug testing um, policies and all of that? I, I think this is definitely one of those issues that we need to stay on top of. Um, again, to your point, not, you know, not because we're trying to, to, um, to catch our people and, and trap them, you know, to, to find ways to get rid of them, but you know, we, there's, we, we just want to make sure that everyone's safe, everyone's protected, and that everyone has the opportunity to, to do their best work. Uh, and that same thing applies to customers and the customer experience. We want customers to be able to come in and, and feel confident and safe in our employees. So it's a matter of that balance. I think that's always 
can be a bit tricky. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the challenge, right? Particularly for those organizations that are in multiple states, because you're constantly looking at what, what are the state regs? How do we address this? Uh, and to be candid, even though the pendulum is switching as we speak, uh, I don't think at the federal level that this particular issue is going to get resolved anytime in the very near future. Uh, and so it's going to continue to be something that as all of our clients want to be employers of choice, they have to truly grapple with in order to make sure everybody's safe, everybody's being treated the same, but at the same time, not trying to be the morality police either. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great, great point. Um, so I'm trying to think in terms of other big uh, trends or any other big cases that you've seen in, in uh, the last year or so, anything else pop out and stick out, out of your mind? You know, I think there are two other areas that are somewhat related. The first is, not surprisingly, COVID litigation and what employers have or have not done. Some, a, a segment of that is uh, individuals who have passed away who contracted COVID at work. Some of it is under the federal FFCRA and how that was or was not dealt with. Uh, and as that, that deadline moves and Congress or states address that um, issue and how time off, whether that is because of kids or their own health, uh, that litigation is ever evolving and it's a slippery slope. Uh, I can tell you that I know for one of my clients, they had... Um, they were literally reading the CDC guidelines every single day, changing their policies every single day to match up. And so I, I think that the one thing we learned from this area is organizations, whether you're remote or frontline, you have got to be following these places that provide medical information as diligently and as broadly as possible. As we get into the vaccine, I think Folks have to take a really hard look about how you're going to address that and how you want to handle that piece going forward. Certainly, organizations are very broad in how they're dealing with that, but also recognizing the other area of litigation that continues to evolve, which is under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and whether folks, you know, there's a reason that they can't get the vaccine or there are other challenges around what are the accommodations. And, you know, there was a time where you had to work at work. And now we've found in many respects, a lot of positions don't have to be at work. And so many organizations now are struggling with what do we really look like? What does our footprint have to be? Uh, how can we operate going forward? And what we're seeing is a lot more litigation in this space as organizations. And what was the, the joke when we were in mid-March? It was well, we're sort of building the plane as we're flying. And in some respects in this area, organizations are doing the exact same thing. And I would just caution folks, what we've seen from the litigation so far is just make sure you've got all your T's crossed and your I's dotted and you have all the backup medically to make sure you're protected in the COVID area and in the ADA space that you have whatever you need to make sure that everything is running exactly the way you want it to and ensure that that interactive process is actually taking place with organizations and, and their employees. Excellent, excellent point. Well, Lewis, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. The time's flown by and we could go on and on and on. I suspect we could talk for hours around uh, the, the employment and labor law landscape and, and shifts and changes. And perhaps if you're open to it, you know, we can get together again soon and continue the conversation. For today, though, we're going to uh, wrap up. And before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get, how they can get connected with you, find out more about what you're up to, um, and give the last word on the topic for today. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, happy to come back and, and chat with you more, of course. Uh, but folks are more than welcome to reach out to me at LinkedIn. Uh, I'm Lewis Lessig on LinkedIn. Also on Twitter, at Lewis Lessig. Uh, or you can look for me as the Employment Law Translator. You can find out more information on my website, lewislessig.com, or at my firm website at brownconnery.com. Uh, but I'm all over the place. I look forward to connecting with folks and doing whatever I can to support the efforts of organizations moving forward. 
Excellent. Thank you. And I really encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Lewis and his law firm and his consulting work uh, can do for you in terms of the needs that you have. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.